preaching on the subject of waiting on God. That is the title of the sermon this morning, Waiting on God. I'm going to be preaching about the virtue of having patience. Now, I want you to focus here in James chapter number 1 with me on verse number 3, where we see this being taught. It says this in verse number 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, we, even more so than anyone else throughout history, live in a day and age and live in a culture where people struggle with patience. And the reason why is because of the Industrial Revolution taking place just a uh, hundred and so years ago. There are, there, are, there are so many different technologies that have been created that give you the advantage of having things in a lot of, in a lot of cases immediately. You know, we have, of course, fast food now, which did not used to exist in the way that it did. Everyone used to have to wait 20 to 30 minutes in order to get a meal anywhere that they went. I mean, let that sit in. That's pretty profound. Not only that, today it's gone to the point where if you want to get something, it doesn't matter virtually what it is, you can get online, you can order it, and if you're willing to pay extra money, you can have it the next day. And it doesn't really matter what it is. I mean, think about that for a minute. We live in a day and age where people don't have to wait. And because of that, because people have become you know, a complacent in this area, everyone, of course, lacks this ability, and that is of patience. People have no patience today. But let me say this. This is a Christian virtue. Now, us as Christians, Lord, this is the world that we live in, and you know, you know, Jesus says that he doesn't want to take us out of the world but keep us from the troubles in the world, right? So this is the world that we live in, but that nonetheless doesn't give us an excuse to not have patience, right? We as Christians, we need to have patience. Now, I'm going to begin this sermon in the, you know, in the, in the introduction, in the preface of it. I want to go into where patience comes from and the areas where we need to have patience and where we need to wait on God. Now, this is a very clear truth that's taught consistently. Number one, I want you to look at our beginning verse here. It says in verse number three, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work it patience. Now I want you to notice what it says there, that the trying of your faith work it patience. What is that referring to? It's referring to hard times in general. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about hard times. Now, this can be tribulation, right? This can be like a type of persecution, or it can just be any sort of trouble or any sort of hard times in general. I'm going to show that to you. I want you to go to Romans chapter number 5, verse number 1 with me. We'll see the consistency of this. Romans chapter number 5, verse number 1. So we saw the trying of your faith, work in patience. I want you to look here at Romans chapter number 5, verse number 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Then he says this, And not only so... <laughs> But we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. It's almost the exact same statement. He says over there in James chapter number 1, James writing, he says that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You know what it says here? Tribulation worketh patience. What does that mean? Hard times, trouble. Tribulation works patience. That means that it creates patience. It works on your patience. It brings about or it produces patience. Patience. I want you to see this once more. Go to, uh, actually a couple times more. Go to Romans chapter number 12. Let's do the one here in the book of Romans since we're already there. I'll read a little bit more to you here in verse number 3 in chapter 5. It says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And then it says this, And patience experience and experience hope. So you're there in, in Romans chapter number 12. Let me get there myself. I want you to look at verse number 12. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 12, it says this. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. So notice what he tells you that you need to do. You need to be patient in tribulation. Go to Luke chapter number 21. Luke chapter number 21. We're going to see this brought up repeatedly in the time of tribulation, saying that you need to have patience. You need to require patience. Look at Luke chapter number 21. Look at verse number 16. This is speaking of the great tribulation to come. And it says this, And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends 
and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. Now what's he talking about right now? The great tribulation to come. Look at the next verse. Uh, verse number 19. In your patience possess ye your souls. I want you to go now to, go to James chapter number 5. Go back to James, the book of James where we were. Go to James chapter number 5. I want you to look at verse number 11. James chapter number 5, verse number 11. James chapter number 5, verse number 11, it says this. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that, that the Lord is very pitif pitiful and of tender mercy. Now it references Job. And what did Job go through? What did he have? Of course, we would define that as persecution, tribulation. He was being attacked. He was being persecuted by the devil, wasn't he? He was being, he was being put through tribulation by Satan. And then what does it tell you that he has and that he needed to go through this time? It says, you have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. Also, you know what you find in this is you find the definition, or at least a partial definition, of the word patience in the Bible. Because the word patience in the Bible is not exactly like we would use it today. Oftentimes, you can look this up yourself, the word patience comes up you know, in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 6 is a perfect example, and it's speaking of Abraham. But it's used multiple times in the book of Hebrews. And what is the book of Hebrews about? It's about enduring, isn't it? It's about enduring in the faith. That's what the book of Hebrews is about, especially the latter portion of the book of Hebrews. And that's what the word patience means in the Bible. It's talking about enduring in the faith. Look at verse number 11 once more. Behold, we count them happy which endure. And then it says this. You have heard of the patience of Job. Now let me give you an example of someone that endured. You have heard of the patience of Job. So the word patience in the Bible has more of a leaning towards what? Towards enduring in the faith, right? I want you to go to Revelation chapter number 1. Verse number 9. Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 9. Just a couple of pages to the right there. Not very far at all. Last book in the Bible. Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 9. Of course, the book of Revelation is centered around what? The great tribulation, right? About the, the hard times to come. Look at Revelation chapter number 1. Look at verse number 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. And then he says this, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. So repeatedly, over and over again, what do we see? We see patience being coupled with tribulation. We saw in the very beginning, well, how do you get patience in the first place? It tells you that the trying of your faith work in patience. It tells, told us also in Romans chapter number five, that patient, that tribulation work it or works patience. It brings about Patience. That's how we get the virtue of patience. I want to give you one more example of this. Look, turn over just one page. Revelation chapter number 2, verse number 19. Revelation chapter number 2, verse number 19. We see the consistency, as always, of the Bible repeatedly. Look at Revelation chapter number 2, verse number 19. It says this. We'll read verse 18 as well. And under the angel of the church in Thyatira, write... These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. You know what he goes on to explain? He talks about their persecution. What is the subject of the, the subject matter of the book of Revelation? Tribulation, right? I and mean, we see this over and over again. He's talking about their them being patient in tribulation. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 1. So what we learn by that is in order to get patience, in order to grow in patience, you must go through tribulation. Now that's why Romans chapter number 5 said that we glory in tribulations also. I want you to think about this. Do you need or do you even require the attribute or the virtue of patience if your life is just always flowery and beautiful and perfect. It's just no bumps in the road. You don't even need patience, do you? You don't even, you won't even require it, do you? No, because everything's just perfect. You're in a state of complete contentment. You never have anything to worry about. 
But you know when you do need patience? You need patience to get through that time of tribulation. That's why it says the trying of your faith worketh patience. So this is an attribute that you grow in. So when we have hard times in our lives, we have trouble in our lives, and there's different types of hard times, right? There can be hard times that just come about in general. There are times when God tries someone's faith, someone's faith, right? Or God can actually try someone's faith. The Bible talks about that repeatedly, like in Genesis chapter number 22, right? But then there are also times when we're going through tribulation where it's persecution of the world, right? So there's different times. But in general, just hard times in general, we as Christians, we should look at our trials and our troubles in a different way. You know why? Because that is an area and where you can now grow as a Christian. Without any trouble, without any tribulation, without any hard times or problems in your lives, this is an attribute that you would never be able to require as a Christian. This is an area in your Christian life where you would never be able to grow. So tr troubles and trials for a Christian, they're a good thing because they strengthen you as a Christian. They strengthen you spiritually. Even when I grew up just playing sports constantly and lifting weights, there's a very common quote that people will use all the time. You know what it is? Can anybody think of what, I'm, what area I'm going at? What? No pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. Or there's another one as well. They'll always say, this is why I was worried. But that's exactly the same thing. It's basically the same exact concept. It's uh, what, what doesn't kill you uh, makes you stronger. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Right? And you know what that is? That's the same concept. Things that don't kill you, like, and what is it referring to? It's a hard time, and it's not killing you. It's hard, and if it's not killing you, you know what it's going to do? When you make it through the trouble, when you make it through the trial, in the end, you're stronger. So right. even the world understands this. It's a very basic concept. So you know what happens when you, when you push yourself, when you're able to get through this hard time, when you're able to get through this trouble, in the end... You're that much stronger at the, at the end. And in the end, you're that much bigger. You're that much stronger. If we're, if we're referring to lifting weights in general, if you never feel any sort of burn in your muscles, that means your muscles are not, you, you are literally tearing your muscles when you get to a point like that. That's scientifically, that's what's happening is you're tearing your muscles down so when they grow back, they get larger. So if you never feel the burn, if you never feel any sort of trial or tribulation when you're lifting weights or anything, you're not going to get any bigger if you're wanting to grow mass on your body. You're not going to get any stronger. You know, so in order to grow in any area of life, you have to go through troubles. You don't get anything for free. Right. Nothing in this world comes easy. Nothing in this world comes free. And this is why we see you know, the snowflake generation in, <laughs> in, in, in full blast, right? Because we live in a time, just as I said before, where everything is just getting handed to people. Where everything is so simple. Well, everything is so convenient. So the people that grow up in this era, they're just used to fast food life, aren't they? They're used to just things being put on a platter and giving to them. They're not used to having to work for things. Right. You know what? A person that never works for something, number one, they, they take it for granted. And number two, they're not growing. They're not getting any better. These aren't areas where they're going to excel in their life. So in order to get better at anything... You have to go through hard times. In order to be a strong Christian, you have to fight a few battles. Amen. You have to fight a few battles in order to be a strong Christian. I want, you, I want to give you some examples of people in the Bible. And I believe this is the greatest example. And this is the example of Abraham. Of Abraham. He is the greatest example of showing patience, of waiting on God. Of waiting on God. Now, there are many areas, and I'm going to touch on this in a minute. There are many areas where we have to wait on God. Where we have to exhibit patience, right? We have to show patience. Now, I want you to go to Genesis 12. Genesis chapter 12, as I said. I want you to look at verse number 1. This is the introduction of the character of Abraham. He's at this time known as Abram. I'm going to refer to him as Abraham. When God first comes to him and gives him the promise. Look at Genesis 12, 1. It says this. Now, the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now I want you to look at verse number four. It says this. 
So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. Now this is not a coincidence, what it's about to tell you. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Notice that it specifically tells you how old he was when he left, when God came to him and gave him that promise. And how old was he? He was 70 and 5 years old. He was, a, he was 75 years old. So he's an older man. I want you to turn now to, I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 15 now. Genesis chapter number 15. Just a few pages forward. Genesis chapter number 15. At the time when God came to Abram, or Abraham, he was 75 years old, as I said, and he had no children at that time. So he didn't come to him and tell him, hey, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And Abraham already had a bunch of children. He already had grandchildren and things of that sort. And his grand, he's talking about the children that he currently already has right then as a contemporary. No, he had zero kids, zero children. So even at that time, this would be a great feat, wouldn't it? Even at that time, this would be a great miracle that God would have been performing. Now I want you to look at Genesis chapter number 15. Genesis chapter number 15, it tells us this. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Now I want you to notice how Abram responds, or Abraham responds to God the second time when he gives to him. He comes to him. He first noticed that when he came to the, the, in Genesis 12, he explained, oh, I'm going to make of you a great nation. So that's when Abram or Abraham moved to the land of Canaan. What did he expect to happen? He said, hey, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your descendants. I'm going to make of you a great nation, and I'm going to give you all this land, right? Well, he's expecting that he's moving in, and what? He's going to be having a child soon. He's expecting, hey, I'm going to be having a kid. I'm going to be having a son. And, I'm gonna, and you'll have this great son who's going to be a prince. He's going to be a king. I'm sure he's thinking all these great things. You know, he's, got, he's going to do great things, right? And he's going to multiply as the sand on the sea. I'm sure he thought this is in the very near future. And I can't wait to get there, right? Well, this is many, many years later. And we can see how Abram's faith is a little weaker, isn't it? Because immediately when God comes to him, he says, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And then verse number two, Abraham answers and he says, and Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? Why did he bring that up? It's like, what are you going to give me? He's saying, I don't have anything. What's his point? I should have a child, shouldn't I? I thought we, you know, uh, made a deal, if you will. I thought you came to me and I was going to follow what you told me. But I don't have a child that you told me you were going to give me. Where is my child? That's what he's saying. Where is this kid that I'm supposed to be getting? What's he doing? He's waiting for that child, isn't he? Well, if we were to keep looking on Genesis 16, look at verse number 1. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. So even more time went on, didn't it? Even more time went on, and it says that she bare him no child. She bare him no children. And then, of course, we know the story of when Abram has the, the, the lapse in his faith with the situation with Hagar and Ishmael comes about, right? Many years end up going on, going past, and Abraham ends up being how old? Does anybody remember? We just went over this. How old was he? 99, exactly. So how many years went by before God actually came and fulfilled the promise that he gave to Abraham? 24, roughly, yeah. I was just going to say 25 years. Roughly 25 years went by. 25 years went by, basically, to wrap it up before God fulfilled the promise that he gave to Abraham. You know what Abraham had to have? He had to have great patience. Do you know what he had to do? He had to wait on God for 25 years. before. Now, I am positive that Abraham did not think that it was going to take 25 years before that was going to be fulfilled. God came to him and God gave him this promise. Do you know what God did? God just let him wait. God could have come to him when he was... If God had a specific time where it worked out better for it because that he would be 99 years old, God could have came to him at 98. Could have came to him at 99. But you know what he told him to do? He chose to do? He said, hey, 
Get thee out of thy country, from my father's house, right? Unto a land that I will show thee. And I'm going to make of you a great nation. And then it says that he went ahead and went right then. And you know what he did? He just waited for 25 years on God. He waited for 25 years before, he, before God decided that he was going to come and fulfill his promise. I want to give you a couple more examples of people that did this uh, in the Bible. I want to give you a couple more examples of people where this happened to. Number one, I want you to think about this. When did the first promise of the Messiah to come, when was it given? The very first promise of the Messiah. What chapter? Genesis 3. Genesis chapter number 3. That's the very first promise of the Messiah. Do you know how many years roughly after that it was until Jesus Christ came and was born? About 4,000 years exactly. It was roughly like 4,000 years before he actually came and was born on this earth. That is a long time. Do you know what everybody was doing that worshipped the God of the Bible at that time for 4,000 years? Do you know what they were doing? Do you know what they were looking towards? Everyone! That, what, that is what it's about! They were waiting on that Messiah to come for 4,000 years. That is a long time. We see this character of God all throughout the Bible. All throughout the Bible. Do you know what they had to do? They had to just trust God that it was going to happen. Do you know what Abraham had to do for those 25 years? He had to just believe those words that were spoken to him in Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to do this. You know what he had to do? They had to have faith. You know what it was? It was the trying of his faith. All those people that were waiting during that period of time, you know what that was going on right there? It was the trying of their faith during that 4,000 years. But you know what? God fulfilled his promise with Isaac, didn't he? That son came, didn't he? He fulfilled his word, which he will. He waited, albeit it took a while, but God fulfilled his promise. The Messiah came, didn't he? It took a period of time. It took a long time. But you know what? The Messiah came. I'll give you another example. Noah. I haven't heard this one mentioned when speaking of waiting on God very much, but Noah is a perfect example of someone that showed patience. God came to Noah and told him what? He told him that, hey, don't confuse Moses with Noah. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, that's a lot of people do. That's why I said that. He told him, hey, I'm going to flood the whole earth. I'm going to kill every living thing. So I'm going to need you to do me a little favor. I'm going to need you to build this massive boat. And he gives them the, you know, the dimensions of the boat. It's huge, right? But do you know how long of time went by before he flooded the earth? It tells you. 120 years went by. Uh, 100, now, that boat is huge, and I don't know, you know, if, he, if Moses or Noah was like, see what I did there? If Noah was like the general contractor and he like hired people out and stuff, but if he built that him and just like five, six other people, however many it was, maybe just his three sons, that would take a very long time. But I still don't know if it would take 120 years. That is a long time. So you, probably, you know what probably happened? Maybe he built that boat in about 50 years, 60 years, and you know what he did the remaining of the time? Waited on God. He just sat there and waited on God. He's got this huge, massive boat sitting in his backyard, and he's just waiting. Do you know what he had to do? He had to trust God. He had to have faith in God. That was the trying of his faith, wasn't it? He had to just... I believe in 70 years or so that there's going to be a massive flood. There's going to be rain, you know, and, and it's going to flood the earth. Wherever, and I'm going to need to get in that boat one day. You know, he just waited on God. I'll give you another example. Joseph. Joseph. Joseph had dreams that he knew, and he had a gift. He knew that these dreams were of God, didn't he? He knew that these dreams were of God, and he even told his brethren about the dreams and how he was going to be a great leader of his brethren, specifically, right? You know what happened to Joseph? Because of that, his brothers became envious. They took him. They threw him in a pit. He was carried. He was put in prison. He was put in prison, and he stayed in Egypt for years. And then, after all of that, after going through all of that, then, you know, he's, he's of course, promoted, and then his brethren come, and we see all of that fulfilled. Now, did it happen immediately? No. He had, and you know what he had, too? Specifically, he had hard times that he went through. He had troubles that he went through. He had, you know, tribulations that he went through, right? He had difficulty in his life. And you know what? What he required at that time? He required patience. 
And without any of that trouble, without any hard times, if that dream would have been fulfilled the very next day, do you know what he wouldn't have received? Do you know what he wouldn't have grown in his life? The virtue of patience. He wouldn't have been a patient person. If it would have just been handed to him immediately, he wouldn't have had to wait on God, would he have? If Abram would have moved to Canaan and immediately God would have fulfilled every single promise to him right away, he wouldn't have required patience. He wouldn't have needed to wait on God, would he? No. He wouldn't have needed patience. But you know what? Abram was that much stronger after he went through his trials, wasn't he? Abram was that much stronger after he went through the 25 years of waiting on God. I am positive that his faith was much stronger after he waited the 25 years and then he saw that God is faithful after the 25 years than if he would have moved there and been given it immediately. The same thing goes for Joseph. I am positive that Joseph's faith in God was that much stronger. After he trusted God all through the hard times, the, all the nights in prison, all the different prisoners coming in and leaving, and he's stuck sitting there this entire time. He, he's, he's foretelling dreams for other people, and then they're being released, and he's just sitting there. You know what he had to do? Just trust God and wait on God and just believe God. And you know, when he saw that everything came through... I am positive at that moment when it clicked in his mind, like, man, that dream and all of those things, it all was just fulfilled right before my eyes. I am positive that his faith was that much stronger at that moment than it would have been prior. If it all would have been just given to him the next day, if something would have worked out where then all of his brethren bowed down to him, his faith wouldn't have been near as strong. So we can see how tribulation works patience, how time and hard times and troubles it strengthens you as a person. Another example is, is Simeon in the Bible, a person that had to wait on God. Simeon had God come to him. Simeon was the older man that, that stayed in the temple. And you know what he was doing? He was just waiting, basically, in the temple, night and day, just waiting all the time. You know what for? The Holy Ghost had, had come to him and told him, before you die, I'm going to show you the salvation of all mankind. I'm going to bring him there. You know? And you know what happened? Before he died, Jesus, as a babe, as a baby, was brought to the temple. And he got to see Jesus before he died. It's the salvation of, of, of the world, isn't it? How, you know, here's the thing. Do you think that the Holy Ghost told him that the day before? No, it tells you that he was going to the temple and waiting in the temple. You know what he had to do? He had to wait on God. You don't think that he had like moments of doubt like going there sometimes? After like a month, two months, three months, however long this was, maybe years went by where he's going to the temple, he's waiting, he sees people coming in and then going out. He's like, that's probably him. And they come in and they just leave. Days go by. But you know what happened? When he saw the salvation of God, when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah brought, I'm sure that his faith was that much stronger in God. I want to give you a bad example of someone that did not wait on God. I want you to go with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 13. 1 Samuel chapter number 13. Sometimes when, you're, when you are following God's will and you are doing that which is commanded you in the Bible, that which God commands you to do, sometimes it just takes a little bit longer to see some fruit. Sometimes it's not immediate. It doesn't happen immediately. There are many, many other examples than I pointed out to you just now. But there are many other areas in life as well where, you, where God promises that if you do this, I'll do this. Where God will bless you for doing certain things. You know the outcome of our children, things like that. Where it may not come immediate, but you know what you have to require? With kids, man, you need patience. Amen. You do. You need patience. And the more you get, you know what you need? More patience. That's what you need. Right? So these areas of our life where God says, hey, this is what I want you to do. And if you do this, this is going to happen. You know what you need to just do? You need to do what he said. You need to follow the Bible. You need to follow the commandments. You need to believe the scriptures. And then just wait on God. And just trust God that what he said is going to happen. I want to give you an example of a very prominent character in the Bible that did not wait on God. And he lost out on a major blessing because he did not wait on God. Once you look at 1 Samuel chapter number 13, I want, to, I want to begin reading verse number 5. It says this. 
And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And people as the, th as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash, eastward from Beth Haven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. So notice that this is a hard time, isn't it? They're scared. They're stressed out. The, 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 the warriors and the soldiers, they're fearful. It's tribulation. Look at verse 7. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal. And all the people followed him, trembling. Now, do you think Saul had a lot of stress on him? I'm sure he did. As a leader, I'm sure that he did. All the people are afraid. And just human nature, when other people are afraid, if you're not a strong enough person, you know what will happen? They'll start rubbing off on you. This is why God commands in the law, if there's any fearful of, of, of the men that are there, tell them to go home and not to stay. If there's any of the warriors that are afraid, you need to leave. Because you know what you're going to do is you're going to cause the other soldiers. You're going to cause the other people to be afraid. So this is, I'm sure, rubbing off on Saul. You know what's happening is Saul's probably like, man, they're right. This is not looking good right now. Look at what it says in verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. Now notice that. He waited seven days, and he waited according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. Now notice, it says this in verse 10, And it came to pass that as soon as... He had made an end of offering the burnt offering. What does that mean? That means literally as soon as he was finished. He got done and he's complete and I'm done making the burnt offering. He turns around and who meets him there? Samuel meets him there. Who is Samuel? Samuel is the prophet at that time who was, who was, uh, who was appointed. He was, he was uh, put into the temple right by Hannah and he was going to stay there and serve God as uh, a war with the priest. He was the one that was supposed to be offering the offering, wasn't he? Now, if we look, if we look in the Bible, uh, this is a this is a good example. Like I, I preached about this the other night. I talked about how you know uh, the symbolism of the priesthood in the Old Testament represented Jesus, and we have all these different areas that represent Jesus. And I talked about how there are the three offices that point to Jesus. You know, like he's he's prophet, he's priest, and he's king. And a lot of people have said. That, I'm sure this is just a side note, but a lot of people have said that the re one of the reasons why Samuel ends up being, or, or Saul ends up being rejected for what he did here is because he tried to take the three offices and they only belong to Jesus. So that's pretty cool. You know, he tried to take the prophet. What does he do? He goes and he prophesies, right, among all the people. He's appointed as or anointed as what? King. And then what does he do right here? He offers, right, he does the job of what the priest was, which Samuel was put into the, he was, he was given as a Nazarite and was given that ability by Hannah and him being given or sanctified and set apart when he grew up in the temple, wasn't he? So Samuel was able to do that. Samuel was given that ability. But was, what was King Saul? He wasn't, was he? So was he supposed to be offering this offering? No. What was he supposed to be doing? What was Samuel's job during this? Right now, are they supposed to be fighting yet? No. He's supposed to be waiting on, or Saul's job. What is Saul's job during this? He's supposed to be waiting on Samuel. That was his job. He just said, hey, I just want you to wait. I'll be there. Don't do anything. Don't start fighting. Don't do anything. And you know what all the other people started doing? They're waiting, and seven days goes by. I mean, what is Samuel doing for seven days, right? Seven days go by. And you know what happens? They're just sitting there while the camp over there is probably getting all riled up. They're yelling and screaming and doing, I don't know what they're doing, but they're, you know, they're obviously doing something that's making all of them afraid, aren't they? They're yelling, 
you know, they're doing their chants or whatever. They're pumped up, and then the Israelites, they're like, man, we're ready to go to battle. We can't do anything until Samuel gets here. So they just start growing in fear. They just start getting more afraid. They're in tribulation. They're having hard times, aren't they? They're trembling. They're afraid. They're hiding themselves. People are hiding themselves. Saul is, I'm sure, getting stressed out. He's getting afraid himself. And what does he do? He's just like, you know what? I don't have to take matters into my own hands. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go ahead and just offer the offering myself. Now, what's very interesting is go back to chapter ten. What it is? Chapter ten. That this commandment for him to wait was given to Saul two years prior to this. Samuel gave Saul this commandment to wait for seven days. It was given to him two years or a year. I'm sorry. A one year prior. Because if you look in uh, 1 Samuel 13, my memory failed me. I thought that he was reigning for two years, but this is where the modern versions make the mistake. It says that he's one year old. But it says in, in 1 Samuel 13, Saul reigned one year. No, he is two. It, it, it's when he had reigned two years is when this took place. That's why. I, did, I didn't look at that passage. I was going off memory. But it says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, this happened. So it was two years after. So. There was two years that went by before all of this took place, right? There was two years when, from the point when Samuel gave Saul this commandment before this happened. Now, that's actually found in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter number 10. A lot of people don't notice this because it's kind of obscure. It's kind of put in a strange spot. But if you look at verse 1, it says this. That's chapter 10, verse 1. <coughs> Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? So what just happened? You know, when he was king of Israel, wasn't he? You keep reading on, you know, this is when he was following his, 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 uh, his father's asses and, and, and all of that. And you keep reading on and, and uh, Samuel tells him some of the things that are going to take place. A lot of it's immediate. If you look down there at verse... Four, it says, speaking of these people that he's going to meet, it says, They will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. After that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass, when thou art come hither to the city, that thou shalt be a company of prophets, coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp and an harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them. And shall be turned into another man. Verse 7. And let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Then verse number 8, it says then. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. And behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings, and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry. Till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. Isn't that in a weird spot? Like where he, he, he appoints him king. He does all this. He tells him how things are going to take place immediately. And you know what he does? He's like, hey, you're going to go to Gilgal. What's going on? Pause the sermon for a minute. She had a weird look on her face. Did I you? <laughs> Sit back now. <laughs> and then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, she was real nervous. That's what it was. She was like rocking. <laughs> no, but he says, you know, you're going to go, all these things are going to happen. These are all things that are going to happen immediately. You're going to prophesy. When did that happen? Immediately. When he left, all this stuff happened immediately. And you know what he says next? And you're going to go to Gilgal. How does it sound? Like, well, after I do those things, then I'm going to do this. But he says, yeah, you're going to go to Gilgal. You're going to do this. You're going to wait seven days. You know what happened? Two years went by. And then Saul went to Gilgal. He went to Gilgal. And he doesn't tell you why he was going to Gilgal. Samuel didn't either, did he? And then he went to Gilgal for the war. But here's the thing. Saul knew what was going on. Because it says that Saul tarried seven days according to the appointed time. So Saul at some point had remembered when, when, I'm sure when they said, hey, we're going to go to Gil, Gilgal and fight, or hey, the Philistines are in Gilgal, he's like, oh, man. Well, maybe, so this must be the prophecy that Samuel had told me about. You know what he did? 
He had to wait two years for that, number one, to even get to the, to the time appointed. And then once he got there, he had literally one job. What? Wait. To wait. To wait for seven days. Just stand there and wait. And the people over there are scaring them. They're trembling, right? Everybody's coming to him. What are we going to do? Why are we not fighting? You know what Saul says? I'm just going to take matters into my own hands. I'm just going to take over the situation. Obviously, you know what happened? Samuel's not coming. I'm just going to have to do this myself. Literally, on the seventh day, it's still the time appointed. He offers the burnt offering. And when he's finished, who's behind him? He turns around and says, as soon as he offered it, it tells you, as soon as he offered it, Samuel comes up. Do you know what he needed? Just a tiny bit more patience. He just needed to wait a little bit longer. That's what he needed. And you know what he would receive? The blessing of God. Because of this, because of this and one other disobedient act, God took the kingship totally from King Saul, 100%. And, com and completely took it from him. It, going forward, his sons, totally. That whole line ended up diverging and going over to the line of Judah because of what Saul did here. And then later on, you know, he, he disobeys one other time the word of the Lord with Samuel as well. When he's supposed to kill everything and he brings back, you know, what and Samuel says, what is this bleeding? I hear in my ears talking about the sheep. He's supposed to kill all of them and he brings the king and all that. This is disobedience. But you know what? What did he not do? He didn't wait. You know what this was? Why did God have Samuel? Why did God have Samuel tell him this prophecy that's not going to take place for two years, and then he just has him wait for seven days? What's the point? Couldn't he have said, hey, I can move a few things out around in my schedule, being that our nation is at war right now, and they're, they're just standing there literally doing nothing? Don't you think Samuel could have said, guys, I'll be back. I need to go to Gilgal for a minute. I have something that's a little bit more of a higher priority. Why did God say, wait seven days? He was trying him. There is no other answer. Do you know what it meant? Either blessing or cursing. That's what it meant. Do you know what he had to do? Do you know what it all comes down to? This is what it really comes down to. He didn't trust God enough. That's why he said, I'm going to have to do this myself. This is a perfect example where the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Sometimes when God tells you to do something, it may not make sense to you. But you know what? You need to do it anyways. Sometimes when you look at your life, you're like, Man, if I make this decision, it doesn't look like it's going to work out. If I do this, it doesn't look like I, you know, I, I'm going to end up getting you know what. It's not going to be the product that God says. But you know what you need to do? Trust God anyways. Amen. You know what it looked like to Saul? Samuel's not coming. It's the end of the seventh day. He said he was coming. It's the time appointed and he's not here. That's how it appeared to Saul. That's how it appeared when anybody just looked. The Holy Ghost clearly is, and that's what it's even conveying to you. It's the set appointed time. Seven days is up. And it didn't happen. It's at the very end. He's like, all right. Yes, i got to step in and do it myself. You know, it's pride is what it is, number one. But, and, that's, and these are the two things in contrast. You know, the man that doesn't want to trust the Lord is a prideful man. He's saying, I need to do it because God's obviously not going to because he's not trusting God. He's not, having, you know, he's not putting you know, uh, uh, matters into God's hands. He's saying, I need to do this myself. So this is the, the perfect example of a person not waiting on God. You know what ends up happening? No blessing for you, Saul. Now you're cursed. Now these, now your descendants going forward. And you know what? Obviously, Saul reacted in the wrong way. This just sent him down. This was just the beginning of a downward spiral of just complete chaos and destruction in his life. And what was what was the problem? He wasn't waiting on the Lord. Now think about this. If Saul would have waited, if Saul would have waited just a little bit longer. Samuel would have came, wouldn't you? Samuel was right around the corner. Right? He was, he was all, while Saul said, you know, I'm going to have to do this myself,
Samuel's maybe walking up the mountain to get there to Saul. Samuel's coming up the mountain to get there to Saul. God had preparations that he was bringing there for him. It's, it's, it's very similar to the situation with, uh, if you think of the trying of Abraham's faith. Because God was the one that tried him there. There's tribulations where the devil does it. There's times where God will try your faith. And the Bible clearly tells you that God tried or tempted Abraham, right? God is clearly trying or tempting Saul here, isn't he? Well, when, when he tempts Abraham, he's telling him, hey, I want you to go and offer Isaac. And, and, and Abraham knew, I believe God. However this happens, Isaac is coming down the mountain with me. But he knew, hey, there's, I'm going to offer a burnt offering. God told me I was, right? So that's why he says God will provide himself a ram. So just like Samuel was walking to meet Saul, what did Abraham find in the thicket? The ram. You know, if he's able to look and see it, it obviously wasn't there before. So it could have been two sides of the mountain. You know what you have? You have Abraham and Isaac walking on one side, and you have this other ram that God having lead up the other side. You have Saul standing there at the very end of the seven days, and he's thinking, this isn't going to come to fruition, is it? And it's not. It's not, he thinks, of course. And then what do you have? He's, he's, he's right around the corner, man. All you have to do is just do what you're told. You know, you know what you have to do right now? It's this, it's this easy. Just wait. And this is a lot of times when people like fall out of church. Is, is maybe when they have things in their own life that they're, they're having to wait on God. And they just they don't develop the patience. Maybe they test a few things. Maybe they understand, hey, the Bible teaches that I'm supposed to be, maybe even this, disciplining my children, spanking my children. And they've been taught prior that, you know, you should do this. When the Bible is very clear, you know, that you know, this, a, a, a spanking is what brings about a good child, an obedient child. Amen. You know, that's what the Bible teaches repeatedly. I can give you ten verses on it. But at least five verses from just the book of Proverbs alone. But you know what? The world tells you something different, doesn't it? And they have all these psychologists. Oh, you know, your kid will be a, you know, a psychopath serial killer if you spank your child. Like all this crazy stupidity, right? No, you can't do that. You shouldn't do this. You know, he's going to grow up to be an aggressive person if you spank him. And the world says this kind of idiocy. It sounds dumb, but, but a person that maybe comes out of the world and just got saved or something like that, they're told, hey, you need to discipline your child. You need to spank your child. And when they're younger, they're like three years old and you're giving them whippings and stuff. Do they, is it just like you spank them once and they're like, all right, I give up. I'm doing whatever you tell me to do. It doesn't work like that, does it? Not even close. That's why everyone's laughing. That's so ridiculous, right? But you know what happens about four, five years later? All of a sudden it's like, hey, go get that now. And they're like, yes, sir. <laughs> and they turn around and they go do it. Amen. Seriously. Do you know what? If you don't wait, and you think that it's going to take two months, three months, you're going to say, what? This doesn't work. I need a different solution. God's word, obviously, isn't right in this area. You know what you need? You need patience. You need to just trust God through that. There's, time, there's other areas of this. And this can relate to uh, Abraham. Um, having children. God says that having children is a blessing, right? And some people out there just aren't able to have children. They've tried and they've tried and they've tried and they just can't have children. You know what? There's a lot of people in the Bible that have that same exact situation happen to them. A lot. And every one of them are dying to have kids. And they're having issues and they can't have kids. They didn't, Sarah didn't have a single child. They weren't able to have a child. And she just says, hey, just have a kid with Agar. Right? You know what she should have done? Just wait. And just trust God. That's what you should have done. That's what people need to do today. They just need to wait. And they just need to trust God. In all areas of their life. Prayers being answered. Just prayers in general. You know, and here's the thing. Let me give you a disclaimer. I'm not talking about just any area of your life. I'm talking about following God's will. Because you know, I have people like Joel Osteen preach a sermon like this, waiting on God. And he's talking about, like, you know, getting that job promotion that you're dying to get. You know, where you can make, you know, $150,000 a year instead of $120,000 a year. You know, you'll be an exec executive. You'll be an upper management instead of lower management. That's not what I'm talking about. 
You know, like you've been praying that God will facilitate your life so that you can pack up and relocate to Hawaii. That's, people think this way, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about truly God's will in your life. Right. You know, the stuff that's probably boring to you, right? The, the, those types of people. Yeah. The things where you're actually going to see the real blessings in your life, where you're actually going to have a prosperous life Amen. if you follow God's word. Those types of things. Spiritual matters. Maybe prayer is being answered and you're praying for something and you know, hey, this has to be God's will. God says that it is. You know this. It's in God's word and you're just praying and you're praying and you're praying about something to happen and it doesn't happen right away. Wait for God. That doesn't mean take matters into your own hands. That doesn't mean to seek an, you know, another route or to go some other way. If God said that it will happen, if you do this, it will happen. Amen. Not on your time, on his time. You know, it'll happen when Samuel gets there. That's when it'll happen. Right. It'll happen when God wants it to happen. God chose to work seven days to go by. God chose for Samuel to come at a certain time, didn't he? God chose 25 years to go by before he fulfilled his promise to Abraham. You know why? Because he wants you to have patience. That's why he tells you, tribulation worketh patience. That's why we glory in tribulation. If we should glory and be happy in tribulation because it works patience, that makes perfect sense when we see people by God going through a hard time sometimes, right? Well, what is he doing? The trying of your faith work with patience. That's what's going on there. God won't tempt you with evil. God, you know, there's a difference in the, in the, the tribulation, the persecution that Satan himself brought to Job and then things that go on like with Genesis 22 and then what we see in 1 Samuel 13. Those are different things. So make sure you understand. But this also, I want you to understand this also. Both of them work patience. Any sort of trouble or hard time brings about the virtue of patience. You know what you need to do during that time? You need to trust God. That's what you need to do. I want you to turn your Bibles to, I want you to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 5. We're going to look at uh, this last current application of, of how we need to trust God. And we need to wait on God. We have all throughout the Bible... We have examples of people having to wait on promises of God. And they're just waiting on God, aren't they? First we have, you know, uh, the first coming of the Messiah. What were they doing? They were in a very literal sense, waiting on God. Is God with us, right? They were waiting on God to show up for the first coming. And guess what? It happened. He came. But guess what? He's coming again. He's coming once more. And you know what you need to do? In a very literal sense, you need to wait on God. Amen. You need to wait on God. You need to trust God and believe that he's coming. Look at James chapter number 5, verse number 7. It talks about this. This is where we were, of course. Look at James. And Hebrews and James both focus on this a lot. Look at James 5, 7. It says this. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband then waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early... And latter rain. Verse 8. But ye, be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want you to turn once more and go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. That's why I told you to go originally, wasn't it? Go, to, go now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. I was going to read one of them, but I, I ended up not putting it here in my Bible. So 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Verse number 5. I'm putting it in my sermon, sorry. Second Thessalonians, yeah, it's not in my Bible. I got one of those NIVs up here. Second Thessalonians <laughs> chapter 3, verse number 5. It says this. And the, Lord, and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Last passage I want you to turn to is Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, verse number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, verse number 8. So there's a lot of good examples of this that we can apply, a lot of applications even, where we can apply this to our life. But it being the first anniversary of Valley Baptist Church. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Today, I want to make this application, of course, to our church. Now, you can read about, and I could probably give you, you know, 10 examples of churches 
that started and a year goes by and there's like basically no members. Where there's no one added to the church. Where there's no new fruit to the church. Right? I can give you scores and scores of examples. Or there's the same amount as there was the first um, service. And that can be discouraging to a degree, can it? You know, it's hard. You're working hard. There's a lot of people getting saved. We've had a lot of visitors. People go and come. You know what? This happens to tons of churches. Great churches. Go read about some of these churches. You know, First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. Great churches that have done great things for God. You know what they all have? All of them virtually have the same exact story. When I started my church, the first three years were rough. Hopefully it's not like Abraham. Those 25 years were a long time. Praise God, we got a member. No, I'm just kidding. You know, but many of them are like, the first three years were rough. The first two years were rough, right? It was a hard time, right? Now, I'll say this. The, the, our first year, I thought was great. Amen. I loved it. I'm not just saying that. I loved it. I thought things went great. So many great things happened. I think that we were blessed tremendously in a lot of ways. Amen. Amen. It was great. But you know what? When you look around the church, you want there to be a bunch of more people, a bunch of new people, don't you? Don't you? Right. And we're trying these different methods. You know, what do we do, right? But you know what? Obviously, you can't quit working. You know, a lot of people have this stupid attitude, this stupid mentality like, God will just add people. Just don't do anything. They'll come. It's like, what's that movie? That just made me think of the field of dreams. And then they'll come. Yeah. No. No, that's not how it works. You need to go and get people saved. You need to confirm the souls. Paul went back to the people that he got saved. You need, to, you need to go out and confirm people. You need to do follow-up. You need to love these people. You need to not just leave them high and dry. You're saved. God bless you. See you in heaven, brother. No, we want to we wanna provoke people and, and, and try to get them into church. Yeah. We do. You stop working and nothing will happen. God, there's never this system where not one single time in the Bible can you give me this, you know, Jesus take the wheel system where you're just like, I'm doing nothing. He'll do everything. Not once. Even salvation, there's still a condition, friend. You've got to believe. Yeah, there may not be any works involved, but what must I do to be saved? You have to believe. People, you know what? If the same people, a lot of the same people have the attitude about people coming to the church, have the same attitude about people getting saved. They'll just get saved, brother. No, they won't. If you don't go tell them how to be saved, they won't get saved. Right. We're not Calvinists. We're, we're anti-Calvinism. God, you know, there's such thing as a free will offering of your own free will where you decide to do it. If someone's going to get saved, they're going to get saved because you're a, you're a minister on his behalf. We have the ministry of reconciliation. I pray ye in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. You need to go to their door and talk to them. Well, guess what? If you want to get somebody into the church, you're going to have to do work for that. You're going to have to do things to get them to come. So definitely don't think it's just going to happen without me doing anything. No, it takes work. You know what you have to do? You have to trust God that it will happen. You have to believe that if we're doing all the right things, God will guide us down the right path of how are we going to you know, show people and get people into the church? We can grow the church so we can do more works for God. Right? So here's the thing. We look at the church and we, we, can, we can maybe become discouraged or frustrated and we can maybe want to start being like Saul. Let's just take matters into my own hands. Let me just, you know, or maybe we just shouldn't do anything at all. You know? Well, there's so many different routes or, or ways that you can go when you get discouraged, when you get frustrated, when you go down this path of just, you know, of, uh, of being distraught. But that's not the right attitude. You need to wait on God. You need to just trust God. Amen. You keep doing the work. But trust God. Do the right things, but trust God. Don't do the right things, and God will not bless you. God will not bless this church. But as a church, if we keep doing what's right, we have the right heart, we want to grow this church for the right reasons, you know what will happen? You'll start seeing Samuel come in, and he'll come over here and sit down. 
be cool. Amen. A guy named Samuel attended service. <laughs> You'll see somebody come in one day, and they'll be here one week, and then they'll be here the next week, and then they'll be here the next week, and then they'll start talking to you about going soul winning. And you know what? It's going to be exciting, isn't it? But you, from now until then, for seven days, right? You know what you need to do? Just trust God. Just wait on God. You know, you know this is, I just thought of this too. I'm wrapping up. I know the Chipotle's here, right? <laughs> just wait. You know, I just thought of this as well. You know, we have the, the situation what happened with the church. You know, I thought it was going to be August uh, 9th, 2017. Do you know what ended up happening? It ended up being 2018, March 25th. You know what I had to go through for a year? Trials and tribulation. And if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't be near as strong as we are today. Amen. I don't believe the church would be near as strong. Yep. Not even close as it is today. If you wouldn't have went through the things that you went through, you wouldn't be near as strong as you are today. You would have never experienced what you went through. You wouldn't be able to relate to that type of situation at all. But if something like that happens again, guess what? You know. Think about Abram. After he went up on that mountain and he did what God told him to do, after Isaac actually ended up being born, do you think that his faith was stronger in God the next time God told him something was going to happen or weaker? Stronger. stronger. When Simeon finally saw the Messiah afterwards, how do you think it, what, what do you think happened that moment to his faith? It's that much stronger. Amen. When Saul finally saw Samuel, if he would have waited, what would have happened to Saul? He would have been that much stronger of a man, that much stronger of a Christian. See so what happens if you wait, if the church will be that much greater and that much stronger. Think about going through the actual great tribulation. If you make it to the end, how much sweeter. Lift up, I always think about that verse. Lift up your head for your redemption draw in time. Amen. After that period of time, how much greater and how much sweeter is it? And you look and you're like, literally, thank God. Yeah. It's that much greater, isn't it? Yeah. Than this fairy tale of any moment he just comes and I'm walking out of work or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. <coughs> you know? But it's that much greater and that much sweeter in the end Amen. when you just trust God. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, verse number 8. It says this. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Yeah. Then it says this. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. A proud man, do you know what he doesn't do? What's the reason why people don't trust Christ? Because they're proud. What was Saul's problem? Pride. We saw that over and over. When that was little in my sight, Samuel tells him later. You know the reason why he didn't wait? Because he was proud, wasn't he? He's a proud man. That's the reason. And he wasn't what? Trusting in God. He wasn't patient. He wasn't waiting on God. What do we see here? Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And then it says this. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. You know who waits? A patient man. A man that's not proud. A man that's humble. A man that's trusting God. That's who waits. And that's who waits on God. That was the problem that Saul had. This is just the beginning of our church. And the beginning, and, and the beginning is going to be nothing like the end. The end will be much like that. We've got our heads and have a word for that. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day. We thank you for being, you know, a, a God of your word.